We're back here for another edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. John Schmilk with you, today's guest. From our friends over at the Draft Network, Jordan Reed. But first, a reminder, you can find the Giants Huddle Podcast on the Giants Podcast Network, which is presented by Investors Bank at Giants.com slash podcast, the Giants mobile app, and your favorite podcast platforms. Well, we're joined by Jordan Reed. And Jordan, the Giants draft is in the book. Six picks. First of all, thanks a lot for being with us. And just your overarching 20,000-foot view look at what the Giants did in the 2021 NFL draft. Well, if there was one word I could use to describe it, it definitely would be value and then also unconventional. I know a lot of people were harping on David Gettleman about never trading back and goes to show you that he listens to the press clippings a little bit. He reads the press clippings a little bit and that he actually traded back twice, if I'm not mistaken. So that really surprised a lot of people. But I really love the selection in the first round of Kadarius Tony, And I think this is a big year for Daniel Jones coming up. And the best way to figure out what you have in Daniel Jones is to surround him with a plethora of weapons. And that's what exactly the Kadarius Tony brings to the forefront, an explosive type of guy. And I'm sure we'll get to these guys a little bit later as far as specifically, but I really like the first two selections, the first three selections, I should say, with Kadarius Tony, Aziz Ojolari. I thought that was outstanding value in the second round, getting who I thought was the best edge rusher in the draft class and then providing some more help in the secondary with Aaron Robinson. Yeah, and it's funny. I laughed when you gave the answer because we did a written reaction to what the draft was on giants.com on Monday. And I, my little, literal quote, I kid you not. If I did define the giants draft with one word, it would be value. And that's exactly what I said to I'm with you. So let's talk about that first down trade down first, first round trade down. Do you think that the value they got for that 11th pick was as good as they could have gotten? Yeah, absolutely. And whenever you're talking about getting a first round pick in next year's draft, you can't really beat that, especially with them trading down so many spots. Uh, I believe it was nine or so that they traded down. So so it it was terrific value for them to get a first round pick in next year's draft. I think with the roster that still does need some help uh, on both sides of the ball. And then you're talking about building for the future as well. And then we know the NFC East is really up for grabs right now. We know it's really unpredictable as far as who can win this division on a year to year basis. And now with this being Daniel Jones's third year, David Gettleman has been adamant about surrounding him with protection and then also weapons as well. And that's what Kadarius Tony does bring to the forefront. Um, I was a big fan of Tony coming out, but he, he's very scheme dependent as far as being able to scheme him open. Uh, I think of the wide receivers that went in the first round, he's probably the most scheme dependent as far as somebody that you have to figure out some ways just to get the ball in his hands as far as manufacturing touches, uh, just because he's a guy that you have to hold your breath whenever he does touch the ball, just because, uh, what I like to say and what I wrote in the scouting report is that he just plays the game as if he doesn't have any bones in his ankles just because he's making guys miss everywhere. And I'm sure he's going to make you guys say, whoa, a couple of moments this year, just because he's lightning in a bottle when he does touch. It. I'll tell you what, I had a few whoa moments watching his film. You had the one play where he somehow keeps his balance with his hand on the ground for like three steps. Uh, he has another spin move. That's just unbelievable. He's breaking tackles. So let's dip into Tony a little bit more here because I think he's an interesting player. What are the things that you think Jason Garrett can do to maximize his value? Because to your point, one of my co-hosts here, Paul Dottino, has kind of labeled him a G receiver, and G means for gadget, right? Where it's not a guy you're just not going to plug in and let him go, you know, run your route tree and we'll throw you the ball. You want to scheme stuff up for him. So what are the things that you would like to see from Jason Garrett and this offense to maximize the return on investment in Tony? Well, he does have to play from the slot. That's what I will say. He, he ran 78% of his routes, I believe, a year ago from the slot. So he definitely has to uh, thrive in that area just because that's where he really likes to call home. He's not an outside guy. Um, he doesn't have the proper adequate length enough to win consistently on the outside. But when you put him in those advantageous matchups against linebackers, against those slot corners, that's really where you're able to see him the most. And, you know, with Saquon Barkley coming back from injury, you don't really want to put a whole workload on him as far as receiving and rushing. And, you know, they like to flex him out in the slot from time to time. And then they like to give him some of those short dump routes of where he can just do whatever he does uh, once he gets the ball in his hands. But now you have a guy like Tony who can ease a little bit of that workload of where you can really ease Saquon back into it of where he doesn't have to have 70, 80 catches this year. You can give, uh, you know, 75% of those touches to Tony now to where he can be put in those advantageous matchups of where um, you can put him in a bind or put those linebackers in those slot the corners in a bind. And also he's going to give you value on special teams as well, as far as a punt returner. I think that was an underrated factor that he does bring to the forefront. Do you have any concern about his ability to stay healthy given his style of play? He's only 195 pounds. And if you watch him on tape, he looks like a pinball bouncing off the fenders in the secondary. And I go back to a guy like Debo Samuel, who's kind of a comparison I've used a little bit for him. He's had injury issues, and he's even a little bit of a bigger guy than Tony is, right? So 
are you concerned at all about him staying healthy given the style in which he plays? Well, it's kind of hard to predict those things really happening. Absolutely. And you can just go based off what happened in this past. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of players that you have injury concerns with, but we don't really know. We can't really predict what's going to happen in the future. And you can't really put that in his mind either. You just have to go out and let him play football. And, I mean, if those injury concerns do arise, you have to scheme up some things of where it does limit his workload a little bit to where it does ease him a little bit. So get him some screen touches, give him some of those jet sweeps, just so where he can get the ball in his hands really quickly. Jordan, you're a former D1 quarterback. How does this addition, and you can even include the Kenny Galladay addition in free agency if you like, how does all these moves that Dave Gettleman's made make things easier for Daniel Jones? Oh, it helps a lot. And my comparison that I've always used for playing quarterback is you're kind of like the mailman. And what I mean by the mailman is that you're just worried about putting the package for these wide receivers on the doorstep. It doesn't really matter. It's not your business of what they do with it after, as far as yards after the catch or if they're scoring or taking the ball to the end zone. So, I, the thing that I've loved that I've did that they've did for Daniel Jones, excuse me, is that they've surrounded him with so many different weapons and all of them bring different types of skill sets to the table. So now what Daniel has to do now is just figure out which situation that these receivers can thrive in. You know, Kadarius Tony is going to thrive in different situations than what Kenny Galladay does. Kenny Galladay is more of a, you know, intermediate to deep type of receiver as opposed to Tony of where you want to get him the ball underneath. And you can take some shots down the field with him periodically, but just figuring out different situations for these wide receivers, but it's a great problem to have. And, you know, when I thought, when I thought about the selection of Tony, I thought they had a really crowded wide receiver room but it's like man you want to get as many weapons as possible for your young quarterback just because you want to get the ball out of his hands as quickly as possible and we know with Daniel Jones he has struggled a little bit as far as turnovers and fumbles of that nature but getting these weapons will alleviate some of those concerns just because he's going to be able to get the ball out a lot a lot quicker and you know before we move on to the second round pick Jordan the last and last what the first round pick is the one I think argument you could have is should the Giants have gone and taken Rashawn Slater he was kind of the guy from that top echelon group that slid down a little bit. Do you think they should have really tried to reinforce the O-line there? Or do you think they made the right move in getting that extra value based on their roster and what they have looking at moving forward? I mean, there's a lot of things that you could say about it, honestly. And we, we won't really know until about three or four years down the road from now. But as far as the value that they got for the pick, I think they'll be just fine with it um, as far as getting more weapons for Daniel Jones. And, of course, they could have got him some more protection. But you can't really complain about getting an extra first-round pick out of it as well. So I think they did just fine with coming out of it. And I know that was a huge surprise for a lot of fans as well, especially when it came across the ticker that we have a trade. Uh, I would have paid to see a lot of reactions of fans faces when that happened. Yeah, no question about it. And then I think the ironic thing here is that giant fans were all upset. They didn't get that premium receiver in the first round. They wanted Jalen Waddle or Devonte Smith. And, you know, all pre-draft processes are talking about, ah, do you pick an edge rusher at 11? Is that a little too early? And one of the guys we talked about in that group was Aziz Ojolari. And then you get to round two. They're picking at 42. They trade back, pick up another third rounder next year, and they still land Ojolari, which that's what I'm most excited about because, to me, that's the ultimate value. If you would have told me last Wednesday that they're getting Aziz Ojolari in a second-round trade back, not up, I would have told you you were crazy. Yeah, and this really surprised a lot of people. I know I think he had a knee issue coming out uh, that ended up – he got flagged for it, rechecks in Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. So that was the main corporate of why he did slip back. But, I mean, some people were saying they should have taken Ojolari at 11, like you mentioned. So to get him at uh, 42, I believe it was, I think that was incredible value. Now, this is a player that I think can start for the Giants right away, and we know they needed help off of the edge. And some people were saying they wanted a receiver, they wanted edge rush help. Uh, whether it was Quiddy Pay or somebody like that uh, at 11. Um, but I think them getting Ojolari and then sliding back and getting a third rounder next year was terrific value as well. But it, I had him as edge one in my rankings uh, prior to the knee injury. I didn't know anything about that just because from the media standpoint, it's hard for us to get inside information or behind the scenes, stuff like that. But, you know, considering the knee and taking everything into the equation, if we're just strictly talking about the player, I think he was the most talented edge rusher in this class as far as, uh, defending the run and then as a pass rusher as well. So getting this type of instant impact help off of the edge, I think was terrific value. All right, break down the player for me. Why did you have him ranked as your top edge? Well, I think upside was one, him only being a redshirt sophomore, a 20-year-old player in the SEC, put up phenomenal numbers, go out to him against Alabama. You can see him taking on Deontay Brown, taking on Alex Leatherwood as a run defender, and he held up really well. 
Um, he, he's a little bit of a one trick pony as far as far as a pass rush specialist right now. But we have to remember that he's only a retro sophomore, so he still has some tools left there to unlock. So you really have to figure out some more moves, how he can get better with his hands. But as far as the explosiveness, um, the speed off of the edge, how quick he is out of the starting blocks and then just the room that he has to grow as a player. That's why I was such a big fan of Aziz Ojalar. Yeah, and look, when you have a guy, and this was a weird edge class, right? But if you have a guy that can win around the edge with that dip and rip move he has, with that swipe move that he has, that's not something that grows on trees, and especially for the Giants who play that kind of 3-4 stand-up brush deal sometimes. He does fit that prototype for somebody that should be able to fit into that defensive scheme. Yeah, and he had a play against Arkansas where he actually guarded a running back on a wheel route. and He's like running side by side with him down the sideline, which is really impressive. And, you know, in Patrick Graham's 3-4 system, you have to have guys that can stand up and then also drop in coverage as well. And Ojolari showed that he's comfortable with doing that. And I think that really set him apart from some of these other guys that really probably weren't a scheme fit as far as being able to drop back in coverage. I think that was a big weaknesses of some of these other guys as far as them just being five techniques in a four three system to be a, a outside linebacker or you know that four technique in a in a four three or excuse me a three four system you have to be able to stand out in coverage as well just because that's something that's going to be asked for you periodically. Yeah, I also saw on tape he, he spoiled the screen pass. I'm trying to remember what team was against. Maybe it was Auburn, I think, mm -hmm. where he kind of read that play on a screen, foiled one of those. And it's funny, you mentioned we have an Inside the Firm Room video feature up on Giants.com right now. You know, one of those Alabama pulling guards came around the edge, and, at, you know, he's getting outweighed by 70 pounds, right, on that play. He dips his shoulder into that guard yeah. and doesn't just hold his ground. He backs that Alabama guard back on the pull. Really, really impressive. And that kind of gets me to – why I think he does have more upside. You mentioned he's just going to be 21 years old. He's a red shirt sophomore while he's only six, two, he's got 34 inch arms, right? So he has the advantage of being a little shorter to kind of do that dip move around the edge, but he has the long arms to keep the tackles off of him. So in a lot of ways, that combination of six, two, but those 34 inch arms, that's almost the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're talking about defending the run as well, just because I think, Something that's missing a lot of times with young edge rushers is that they let a lot of people or a lot of blockers get into their body too soon. And what happens is they lose control at the point of attack. You don't really see that a lot with Aziz Ojolari. And it's very rare to find a player, especially at his young of an age, to, to be so conscientious and then just so aware as a run defender. And what you notice is that as the season goes along, he just consistently and continuously gets better. And he had the highlight game against Cincinnati of where he was just able to take over in the Peach Bowl and the bowl game where he was just phenomenal. So that's something that you want to see, especially leading up to the pre-draft process. And then with these young players is that you want to see them constantly get better so they can have that momentum going into the pre-draft process of where – maybe this kid's football is best days are ahead of him. So that's why I was a huge fan of Ojolari. I think his best days are ahead of him. And you just really – you saw that light start to turn on week by week by week. All right, let's go to the third round, Aaron Robinson. They move up to select him. And, boy, you watch him on tape. If you want to press corner to play the slot, I'm not sure there's a better guy in this class you could have picked because that's pretty much all he does, right? Yeah. Yeah, a really impressive play slot and then also outside as well. I thought he was one of the more impressive players down at the senior bowl. Just think about of all the defensive back prospects down at in Mobile. I think he was one that definitely did stand out. Um, I mean, you can watch him in any game last season. He was really impressive, very physical. Uh, that's something that you noticed about him as well. Outstanding against the run, not shy at all to come up and tackle, which is something that, you know, Dave Gettleman does love and something that he's talked about glowingly as far as some players that they have signed and then drafted in years past. So I think with Robinson, though, he's a player that you can play him on the outside or you can play him on the inside, just depending on where you want uh, to see him contribute at, contribute at immediately. But we know they hit a home run, with the James Bradbury signing a year ago. So just adding a guy like Aaron Robinson, he can give you insurance at a lot of different places. Yeah, I think the one thing that I noticed, I'd like to get your take on it. He's a very physical player. You like that if you're going to play bump and run and press. But in the NFL, once you get past that five-yard mark, those flags start flying. And I even thought, not just on tape, but in senior bowl, too, you mentioned, he was very, very handsy, I thought, when guys got the, down the field on him. Did you see that, too? And what are the things he can work on to try to clean that up? 
Yeah, it's just a learning curve for him as far as some things that he was able to get away with. And it's really hard to let up off of guys, especially when you kind of have them in your grasp. Initially, you kind of do you want to do what's called finishing them. So just not letting them off the line at all. And that's something that he's going to have to learn. Uh, he could be a little bit of a flag magnet early, early on. They're probably going to put the block boxing gloves on him in practice just so he can't grab so much. That's something that's uh, popular with defensive back coaches across the league, especially when you have a young quarterback cornerback that's really handsy the boxing gloves just prevents him from grabbing initially at the point of attack you know, off the line of scrimmage. So that's something we could see them do with him. But, um, you know, down the field, it does become a little bit of a problem, but it's just a matter of him just trusting his technique a little bit more. And it just comes with reps, honestly, John. And I think as he continuously gets more reps throughout training camp and throughout preseason and then eventually in the regular season, I think it's something he'll become more comfortable with. Yeah, and I think the way he compliments Darnay Holmes is interesting. They used a fourth-round pick on Holmes last year, also a slot player. And I do think their skills actually do complement each other pretty well, right? Yeah, and Darnay was another guy who really stood out at the Senior Bowl a year ago. And you notice that they're starting to put together a really aggressive secondary. And we know with these talented wide receiver corps in the NFC East, you know, you're going to be going up against guys like Devontae Smith now, uh, Terry McLaurin. Uh, as well. So there's a lot of different as, as far as skill sets and diversity throughout the division that you're going to see periodically. And also what you notice is that they play inside and also outside. So you have to have uh, some very talented players in both areas uh, across the formation of where you're able to depend upon all of those guys. So Robinson is going to be a welcome addition to the secondary. All right, let's go to the fourth round. Another guy that I thought had a really nice senior bowl, Ellerson Smith. We saw his teammate too, Spencer Brown out there. But Smith, to me, is a guy where you're just betting on continued growth, right? I think he gained 50 to 60 pounds worth of muscle, or of weight at least. I don't know if it was all muscle. When he went to Northern Iowa, showed up as a wide receiver, played defensive end, long, you know, live. He can get around the edge. You know, you're probably not going to use him on first and second down or on the goal line anytime soon. But this is a guy that has a pass rusher's body, Jordan. What are some of the things he needs you think needs to clean up and improve on to continue to improve to take that next step into the NFL? Well, he's probably going to be what's called a DPR early on, which is just a designated pass rusher. You probably just want to use him on third down initially just because he is a little bit light right now. I think he weighed in at around 250, 255 pounds at his pro day, so uh, which is much heavier uh, than what he was initially uh, throughout the season. Didn't see him play at all last year just because of COVID and Northern Iowa having their season canceled. But I thought he did a really good job of really kind of selling himself at the pro day. And he was outstanding as far as the numbers that he did have. I think he jumped like 41 and a half in the vertical um, and then ran in the four sevens, if I'm not mistaken. So really impressive uh, output for him. And that's something that you want to see, especially from a player that we didn't see at all last year, which I think is going to hurt him a little bit, especially when you talk about a player that's a little bit on the lighter side. And then um, one that you want to see him get better as far as his development, but Similar to Robinson, I think he's another player that's only going to get better as he gets more exposure to playing time. So I don't think he's going to be used a lot on first or second down just because he's so light. Uh, he does get cleared out uh, as far as the edge a little bit more than you're liking. Um, just because he is a little bit light, he doesn't really have a lot of ground to stand on right now. But as he continues to gain weight um, and then you start to use him a little bit more and he shows himself on third down and earns some first and second down snaps, I think he's only going to get better. Yeah, you mentioned um, his ability – at the senior bowl in his pro day, 97th percentile. If you look at the relative athletic score, you know, rating system for guys dating back to 87 off the edge. So really good athletic testing. When you watched him at college, generally, how did he win on his pass rushes when he did win? Was he more of an outside guy? Did he have inside moves? How did he generally win on his pass rush? Well, it was a combination of a lot of things. I think he was absolutely the best athlete on the field. So what you notice is that he did a lot of what I like to call out athleting people that just means no, just exactly running up what you mean absolutely <laughs> just yeah so he, he was the best player on his high school team and he's just running all over the field out athlete and everybody that's a similar thing that you see on the fcs level where he wasn't using his hands a whole bunch he was just running as fast as he could up the apex of the pocket and then just turning the corner and just absolutely closing on the quarterback before those offensive tackles could even get a hand on him so that's something that you notice a lot with him now he needs to take that next step in his development of where he has a go-to move and then once he gets that go-to move now it's established a second and the third move and then let's do what's called uh, just having answers to offensive tackles that are going to start to get their hands on him so that's the next step of his development and some in the next level that you want to see unlocked with him all right let's go to the two six round picks you have gary brightwell out of arizona they talked about him a lot as a special teams player in their in their press conference Re finally got that full-time job at arizona uh, as a senior 
Your thoughts on him? Is he a guy that you think could eventually break into the running back mix? Or do you think he's mostly a, one of these, you know, do everything core special teams player, which by the way, could find them a room, a spot on an NFL team yeah. for a real long time. I think it's initially going to have to come as a special teams guy, just because we know with Saquon, he's going to be the bona fide guy at the top of the depth chart. And there just isn't a lot of carries or even rece receptions for him anywhere, especially now factoring Kadarius Tony and Kenny Galladay as well. There's just not a lot of footballs there for him. The, the Giants are very deep as long as, as along their wide receiver corps. And then you have uh, what I like to call that alien coming back in the backfield <laughs> with Saquon Barkley. So there just isn't a lot of touches for him uh, right now. So it's probably going to have to come on special teams initially. And it's not just as a returner. I mean, he can be on every single unit as well. Maybe that's a way to show and gain the coach's respect of where he can take over those Wayne Gallman snaps that we saw from a year ago. So maybe he can get that, that running back two or running back three spot eventually. You know, Rodarius Williams is interesting. He's a guy that set the um, Oklahoma State record for consecutive starts with 48. He started every year he was there, all four years. Why do you think he slid to the sixth round, given his level of experience? Look at some of the underlying metrics in his senior year. He played really well. You're just Your thoughts on what you saw from him on tape and why he made it to the sixth round? Well, I think the biggest thing is probably his age. I think there was a lot of teams that a lot of teams that probably weren't comfortable with it. Him being a 25 year old rookie that probably eliminated him a lot from a lot of teams boards just because there's a lot of teams, especially ones that are more analytically driven that really like those younger players, 20, 21 or 22 years old. That's really in their neighborhood. So him being 25, I think that probably eliminated him off of a lot of boards. But as far as a player, very intriguing player as far as a late round guy, I think he's very polished in his technique. I think he needs to get a little bit better as far as exiting phase and then turning and running and remaining sticky with wide receivers down the sideline. And that's something that you want to see uh, with him do a little bit better. Um, his production could have been a little bit better, too, as far as interceptions. He had a, a ton of dropped interceptions on tape of where his stats could have looked much better. But he had a lot of pass deflections and a lot of pass defense. That's what you notice about his stats of where he just wasn't finishing. So just the combination of being able to finish plays with interceptions or turnovers and then his age, I think, factored into a lot. All right, Jordan, two more questions for you. One, and this is going to sound crazy, but I've actually gotten mailbag questions from Giants.com about this, so I have to ask somebody that, that knows what they're talking about. Next year's draft class, do you have any idea where the strengths are? Giants fans are all excited. They get two first-round picks. So what should they start thinking about about a year out from the 2022 draft? So I haven't studied uh, any of the cornerback or quarterbacks, excuse me. Um, I haven't studied pretty much any guys at all right now, but just looking over uh, some of the notes, of course, I think edge rusher is definitely one that is very uh, deep right now. Um, and I think cornerback is one that would be very deep as well. Just looking at some of the names and then some of the, the standout sophomores that I've seen on my list. So edge rusher and cornerback are two that I think are really expected to be really deep. Hey, two premium positions. Can't go wrong with that. And now, finally, you mentioned at the start of the show, so I uh, interview, I guess I should ask you this too. NFC East now, man. I mean, this thing's wild every year. You haven't had a repeat winner in more than 15 years back when Donovan McNabb and Andy Reid did it with the Eagles. are going back that far. Your thoughts on what this division is going to look like this year and what the Giants' chances are? We don't know. That's the great thing about it, John. Like you said, there's no, there hasn't been a repeat champion in a long, long time. Washington looks really good on paper as far as their defense. They've had a really nice offseason. Uh, they won it last year. So I think Philly's in a bit of a rebuilding mode, trying to turn over their roster a little bit. I think Dallas is going to be better now that Dak Prescott is back. And then they have some, some more arsenal uh, things that they have added to their arsenal. But I think the Giants are in really good standing. It's just a matter of that next step with Daniel Jones. I think that's really what this next season really is going to be heavily, heavily relied upon. Just can he take that next step? Can he limit the turnovers and can he figure out a way to distribute the ball to these plethora of weapons that David Gettleman has really offered him at, at his disposal? So I think the Giants can be in contention. I think the defense is going to be better. I like what Patrick Graham was able to do last year. I think he surprised a lot of people with the, the output that he was able to get from this defense. So I really like what they have added on that side of the football. Um, and then the offensive additions that they have made as well. But it all comes down to number eight, if he can take that next step. And Giant fans, looking forward to see you. Jordan, awesome stuff. Tell the folks where they can find you on Twitter and where they can find your work and everything you guys are doing over there at the Draft Network. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Reed. That's J-O-R-D-A-N underscore R-E-I-D. You can find my work on the draftnetwork.com. Uh, we're going to reset our mock draft simulator probably in the next week or so for those of you that want to go ahead and get started on 2022. You don't want to waste any time. 
Uh, so you are able to do that. We have recap articles coming out every day as far as every draft class. And then there's plenty of other stuff that's going up every day as well. So go check that out at the draftnetwork.com. Yeah. And guys, we've had their writers and analysts on all year. Kyle Krabs, Joe Marino, Benjamin Solak, Trevor Sikama. The guys do a great job. Make sure you go check it out. Jordan, stay safe, my friend. Please get some rest before you start looking at that 22 tape, please. Absolutely. I'm going to take the month of May off and then get back at it in June. Thanks so All much right, for having get, me. Get John. back at it, man. Call on vacation. <laughs> Have a good time. That's another episode of the John Settle Podcast. For Jordan Reed, I'm John Schmoke. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, it's on the John's Podcast Network presented by Investors Bank. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks for being with us.